date is the 1st of January, 1990. I and, uh, Huh? <laughs> My camera's tilting. And let's just start to find out how you guys got to meet each other. How did you meet each other? Some bar or something? Where, where was it? <laughs> how did you meet me, Bob? Want me to talk? Sure. Well, it was in uh, August of 19... 49, I graduated from Citadel, flew to Pittsburgh on, I graduated on Saturday, flew to Pittsburgh on Sunday, started work at American Bridge Company on Monday morning. And the first person I met at American Bridge Company was Dwayne Domerg. So American Bridge Company was your first place of work after you left? After, after I graduated from the Citadel, yeah. Dwayne, Dwayne worked in the employment office and she filled out my W-2 forms and had a bear trap under her desk and she caught my foot in it. And I never got away. It wasn't a bear trap, it was a bear trap. Oh. So you guys met on the first day of your work. Right. Is that right? Yeah, well some people take souvenirs, buy souvenirs, and I sort of just latched onto my souvenir, my first job. Dwayne, uh, was it uh, love at first sight or could you, uh, I mean, could you Stomach the thought of him asking No, actually, he needed a job, and I felt sorry for him. <laughs> I said, if you want to work for my company, fine. <laughs> you do a good job, I'll give you. <laughs> so, so you guys met each other for the first day, but how long did it take before you were, got serious? How long before we got serious? It was one year before we got married. Oh, we oh. got married uh, the following August. What's that? Um, We've been serious ever since. <laughs> <laughs> this is for posterity. I married, I married, I married a giggling, a giggling schmoo by James R. Condon. We used to be a fun-loving couple. The man's trying to do a serious documentary, and you want to yeah. giggle your way through it. All right, Bob. Bob. Yeah. Let's let's go back to the Citadel. Sarah, can you go over to mom? Sarah. Great, thanks a lot. Can you go over to mom? Sarah, no, Sarah. today. Ooh. Okay, sit down there. Great. I never realized you had such <laughs> obstacles. Don't do that. Uh, hey, look at that thing almost fell on your head. Wait, hold it. No. Here we are. We're, we're picking up. Let's go back to, uh, You're the director. to Bob's uh, college experience. Now, you grew up in Charleston, right? <laughs> yes, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> and and uh, why did you go to the Citadel? Was that just everybody from your area go to Citadel? Or? No, no, nobody from my area went to the Citadel. Only a chosen few. I really think you'd do this better if we did it individually. It depends on what you want to do with it. All right, well, sure. You know, yeah, I mean, I'm you know, if you if you want thirty minutes of giggling, no, we'll, that's we can right. we can do it. But uh, if you want something seriously, like you told me, you had your aunts and your parents and all to look back on through the years. I don't think that's what you want to be remembered as. You know? Okay. If you do, right. fine. But I'll tell you what. I, I got a way to solve that problem. Dwayne, tell me about your. Uh, where'd you go to school? Where'd you grow up? It was so long ago, I don't remember. She hasn't. You're beginning to, you're beginning to latch on to the in problem. Average Pennsylvania. You've, cut, you've cut right through to the... Hey, what did you do quick. at American Bridge Company? What did I do yeah, at American do? Bridge Company? That was the question. Um, <laughs> I worked in the employment office. How long did you work? Gave there? people jobs. Ask him to repeat, did you? Ask him to repeat yes, the question. So you recommended people... You, you were. No, I didn't. You took I had a boss. And I just typed everything up for them and took their pictures. <laughs> you took applications and pictures and so forth? How yes. long did you work there before Bob went there? What, about two years? I wasn't there before I got there. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time, Jared. It's hard to remember. <laughs> so you were there about two years then, huh? Uh, no, no. I worked there, uh, let's see, graduated in 47. When did you graduate where, from college? Wait, wait a minute. Where did you graduate from? Ambridge High School. In, Ambridge, in, Pennsylvania. In what year? 47, did you say? 1947. Yeah. Right after the war years, I was too late to become a wave. A wave? What's a wave? That was the girls that went into the Navy. <laughs> I loved the uniforms. <laughs> and I was going to go into the waves. <laughs> so you, uh... And I got out of high school too late. <laughs> And the war was over, and I decided I wouldn't go in. Well, that was good that the war was over, right. wasn't it? Oh, very good. <laughs> now, Bob, you grew up in Charleston, right? You told me that, right? Right, yes. And we're, we're in Charleston. We lived at 9 Perry Street, one block away from Mitchell Playground and Mitchell School. What year were you born? 
<laughs> is that required? <laughs> yeah. We can figure it's out. It's an <laughs> Well, I was, I was born in 1925. And Dwayne? Where were you born? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I really don't want to be on this thing. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to get your peg no matter what. January 7th, 1929. I lived at 523 Merchant Street, Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Now, was that the I same? shopped in Pittsburgh. <laughs> was that the same place that we used to go visit Granny all the time? Home of the Steelers. That's the same? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we're up to the point where you guys met each other, and you got <laughs> married a year after. You got married where? In Ambridge? In Ambridge. Yeah. And then, Presbyterian at Church the in Ambridge. At United Presbyterian Church. And then what happened? Where did you go? Did you continue to work at American Bridge Company for 10 no, years? No. Or? no, no, no. I had already. Back in those days, now this will be of interest because this is a historical thing. Okay. And they can't do this to women anymore. Okay. Back in those days when I got married to Bob, had we stayed in Ambridge and lived, I would not have been able to work for the American Bridge Company anymore. That's a subsidiary of U.S. Steel, and all women that got married had to quit the company because they could not work there once they were married. Why was that? I don't know why. That was a company ruling. There were only three gals that worked for the company, and they were there before that ruling was put into effect. Because but they, they hired no married women. They only hired, because mar hired people out of high school, like young young people. In those days, married women had babies, and, and babies created home. problems with working. Right. Mm. So you so, can't get away with that today, then? No, right. You can't been, do that anymore. Right. They've been liberated. But back then, that was the ruling, <laughs> the company ruling, and once you got married, like if we had stayed there, he could have continued to work for the company, but I would have had to go work someplace else. Dwayne, what were some of your hobbies when you grew up, before you got married? When you were in high school, what were my you were in junior high school? What, what did you like to do? What was your favorite? I bowled all my life. I played a little bit at tennis. I loved to ride a bicycle. Uh, I liked to... Don't forget the dancing. Do a dance. <laughs> <laughs> Went dancing every night of my life. Uh, there, there. You, almost. You almost <laughs> forgot it. Do I get the impression that dancing was the most important thing that you did when you were... Probably said so that and You loved that the most? Yep. Show them a few steps. No, don't, don't do that. You're going to drag my microphone <laughs> no. all over the place. Uh, what, what were some of your hobbies? I mean, did you play baseball? Did you play well, yeah, that's why I told you, uh, the, really a half a block from Mitchell Playground, I was the middle of five boys. So we were essentially raised on the playground. You came home from school, you changed your school clothes into play clothes, and you headed for the playground. You stayed there till the sun went down, then you came home for dinner. And uh, we played uh, everything in season. We played basketball, baseball, football, didn't have hockey down south, <laughs> but all, all of the uh, outdoor sports is... Uh, you, you probably didn't have a problem finding anybody to play with because you had a lot of brothers, right? I had four brothers. I had people to fight with all the time, particularly my brother, Ed. <laughs> Ed was the worst one of the bunch. I'll Why? say that because you know Ed. Why is that? And he teased. He was a teaser. He would pick on everybody, pick on you and pick on you and pick on you until you fought, and then your mother would get involved and she'd say, well, both of you are responsible and you both get punished. So. But Ed didn't seem to mind. He always loved to have a fight. So the rest of us did all right. But old Ed, he's, he's a little soft in the head. <laughs> did, did your mom try to, uh, I heard rumors, tried to have a, a little girl. And is that why there were five boys? I think she'd have loved a girl. But it took them five before they decided to give up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and uh, you know, we were, we were good Protestants. We weren't Catholic having children, uh, you know, I mean, they, they, they wanted a girl very much so. It's tended to write itself, though, as you probably noticed, the, the five boys have probably produced uh, what, 12 or 15 girls. Uh, the first granddaughter was a girl. Mom <laughs> all, was very happy. <laughs> all, grand, all granddaughters are girls. <laughs> now, where, yeah. where, where first grandchild was a girl. Where Sorry do all your that. brothers live now? Uh, they're all in Charleston now. Uh, my oldest brother Bill, who spent most of his life in the Navy, is back living in Charleston, and and he was the oldest. And then Ed, and Ed is retired from the Navy Yard now, retired from several other jobs and in real estate business in Charleston. And then there's me, and then there's brother, and, and I live in Cleveland, incidentally. And um, then there's brother so Louis. I took him away from all that. <laughs> brother Louis, who's the judge, the uh, the attorney, he's down in Charleston, and uh, then there's brother Dick.
my my baby brother, who is uh, has the Charleston Blue Company, the printing company down in Charleston. So they're all down there, except except for for, for us. How did everybody get interested in their own profession? How did you get interested in, in what you did? Well, it was a funny thing. I came home from, from the military and I went to the Citadel, as I, as I started to tell you before, not because um, uh, that was the school that I particularly wanted to go to, but it was the closest school. And uh, the Citadel is a military college. And uh, normally they, they require everybody to wear uniforms and take military training, but just coming out of the military, and actually, in my family, my parents put nobody through college. If it hadn't been for the war, probably we would not have had anybody go through college because my dad had, <clears throat> my dad had had to drop out of school at uh, or maybe third grade and go to work to support his family. What did your dad do? He was a locomotive engineer on the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad, which is quite quite some accomplishment. Uh, and he, he did worked, the Florida to New York run. He worked uh, all through the Depression. You know, we were a Depression family, really, but my dad never was out of a job, and so we never really suffered. We always had enough to eat, and we had a place to live. But um, as far as going to school, and that's one reason, well, I guess I got ahead of myself there. I, I, I left high school in my senior year. I went to work at the uh, Naval Shipyard. I served an apprenticeship as a, as a shipfitter because my dad said it's important that you have a trade. If you have a trade, you can do something in life and you'll have a job. School is fine, but it don't teach you how to work. And so um, I took the exam and became, a, and I passed and did good and I became an apprentice ship footer working at the Naval Shipyard right there in Charleston. And then the big war happened and I was, of course, single and uh, eager to participate in whatever was going on, so I went into the war. How old were you when you went in? I was 18, and that got me away from the from the naval shipyard. Otherwise, my whole life would have been different. We'd have never met. Right. And so after I'd been in the after I'd been in the Air Force for, oh, I got to tell you that I won the war. <laughs> uh, well, now that you can laugh, but I actually flew 23 combat missions over over Germany. I was an aerial gunner in the Eighth Air Force on B, flying in B-17s. So you were the guy who actually. Man, the gun. I I went to gunnery training, and you shot at you shot at enemy airplanes when you were when you were close enough, and when they weren't, if you were close to the ground, you shot at things on the ground. You shot at the enemy, whatever you thought was the enemy. And I was there on April twenty, I think it's the twenty fifth. It might be the twenty third, nineteen forty five. The uh, the last uh, air raid of World War Two for the Eighth Air Force, which was really the last air raid, was flown over the School of Munition Works in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. And I was on that, and we were one of the last airplanes to drop bombs. And uh, out of our out of our 12-plane formation, we lost three airplanes that day because the kind Uncle Sam radioed ahead that we were coming and that the workers, they were Czechs, they were not Germans, should stay home because the 8th Air Force was coming to blow the School of Munition Works off the face of the map. So that gave the Germans time to get ready because it was like a three hour, three and a half hour run to get in that far, that deep into, into Europe. And so by the time we got there, they were all ready with all the act, act they had. And so it was very, uh, a very serious, a very serious air raid in which we lost a lot of airplanes and saw people getting shot and killed and all. What, what was it like to be, I mean, you know, I can't imagine what it would be like to be up there in one of those fighter aircrafts and shooting at other airplanes. Do you remember anything? Vivid? Well, I remember being scared, Jared. That's the one thing I do, remember being skewed. And we used to go, if you had 25 missions, then you got to come home. And I had 23 when the war ended. And so um, as you went on, the chances of you making it back home got less because people were getting killed. And, you know, I mean, it was a clean way. It was a clean way to fight a war because we slept in nice, clean beds in England. As a matter of fact, on my first air raid, my first mission, uh, I got... Uh, uh, on report is what they called it in, in the Air Force because I didn't make my bed before I went out to fight the enemy. I was so excited, you know, going out to fight the Germans and they, they wake you up like four o'clock in the morning and you had briefing and you had breakfast and all and you're just excited and you jumped out of bed and put your clothes on and went running to the, to the mess hall to be briefed on what you were going to do. Never dawned on me that you had to make your bed. When we came back, the sergeant couldn't take care less. We got shot up, our airplane was full of holes and we were restricted to the base. We couldn't, we couldn't go into to town or anything after that because we had not made our beds and swept around our area. We lived in Quonset huts. I mean, it's the most 
illogical, uncivilized way to fight a war. You know, you're out there, people getting killed, and here's somebody chewing you out because you didn't make your bed. You know, I mean, it's like a like a child doing good in one way and bad in another way. So it was so that part was very tough. No, no. The whole military doesn't make any sense, and, uh, and, and wars are for young people. You have to be very young, and you have to believe in discipline. I mean, I, I remember being very bitter when I was first in, uh, in, in the military and the Air Force in Colby College, Waterville, Maine, because the guy in charge of all of us, and we were like a thousand Air Force people, had been, had, had been an insurance salesman. I mean. To me, that wasn't any great accomplishment in life. I mean, if he'd have been a West Point graduate, a soldier, a military person, leading troops, but he was, he was a, an insurance salesman who had taken ROTC in college, and he was our commander, or commandant, or something, and made the rules and all, and you know, I mean, but, you know, I, w I was put on KP. I, 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 I was an enlisted man. My name was Condon, it starts with a C. They start, they start the roster, and the first people, the first people that um, go down, you know, Alphabetic. alphabetically, you do this, you do that, you do that. C's with pot and pans. Pots and pans, the worst damn thing there was. Day after day after day. I didn't like this. And I tried to... I know to how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to tell them so, you know. They didn't listen. You know, and I never got over it. One sergeant said, you don't like it, why don't you go home? as if I could go home. And I said, well, you stupid. Jeez. You know what? I, if I could get the hell out of here, I would. And so uh, my, my whole military was like that. I really joined the Air Force to be a, a fighter pilot. I thought I could be a fighter pilot. But I dropped out of high school to go to the Naval Shipyard. I did not have a high school diploma in my hand. I always think this, this hurt me. Pilots were being made after coming out of Colby College and you saw some of the people who were made pilots, they weren't any smarter than I were. I were, I was. <laughs> I, they weren't any smarter I believe, than I, I believe. than I is B. But they were made pilots and they had the, the the lieutenant's bars and all. And I didn't. And and what they did with me is they 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 gave me a special score called uh, uh, registered pre flight but not admitted. So they just made a new category that you had high enough score but they didn't send you on to pre-flight training. So then you had to go through pre-flight training and become a commissioned officer. And I didn't go through pre-flight training and I never became a commissioned officer. How long were you in the military total? Uh, two and a half years. What rank were staff, you? I was staff sergeant when I got out. So in my 23 missions, I got out early. <coughs> I got out in, uh, in November 45, right after Thanksgiving, I got out. Is so that, because, I was one of the, is that because the war had? The war, the war had ended, I was in Europe and uh, I had enough uh, time in, in, in you got con credit for the combat missions and things, so we, I got sent home, one of the first ones. Came home in the Queen Mary, incidentally. Great, great adventure coming home with, with 5,000 other troops on one boat. You know, it was just... Were there a million people waiting for you to get off? Or was it no, that type of thing? Or? No, but there was the... Um, uh, oh, what were those? Those four girls who used to sing together were so... Big doing. Neanders. No, no, kind, kind of like that. But, uh, anyways, uh, they were there to meet us, and this was big time, like sang, sang with Tommy Jams and people like that, and uh, right down at the dock. And the Red Cross was there, and they gave you donuts and all, and they made you feel appreciated. And the fireboats shot the hoses out, and you know, and, and I stayed up all night so I could in see New York? The, in New York City, so I could see the Statue of Liberty. So as he came in, because of being raised in South Carolina, I had never re really seen the Statue of Liberty, and you had to be on that side of the boat. And with that many troops on board, if you weren't there, and plus I wasn't tall enough, you know, to see over anybody's head, you'd be going right by it, and you wouldn't even see the Statue of Liberty. So I was right down at the rail from like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning until daybreak when we went on in the harbor. Ah, that's, that's the kind of things I remember. Those kind of things. The bad things, God, they, were, they tried to get you to re-enlist, uh, they tried to, uh, you know, entice you, and I got discharged in North Carolina. They would, they would serve five meals, five meals a day. You could sleep in in the morning. They had a regular breakfast, lunch, and dinner time. If you didn't wake up on time, you went over to the mess hall, and there was a sergeant to fix whatever you wanted. Wait a minute, this is near the end of your... This, the, your war was o duty, the war was over. And this is how they got you? They want you to re-enlist. They took you on tours. They would take you in to play golf at... Uh, 
at, at golf courses all over North Carolina. They took you on tours of the cigarette factories and plants and things. They were just, they were just so nice. No, no commissions. You stayed as you were, but um, they they tried to talk to you about how hard it was going to be to get jobs and to stay in the military. But that's when you remember, no way, man. You remembered every nasty thing they had done to you. You said, get me out of here. Get me out of here. So I got out. That's when I went to the Citadel and because it was in Charleston. I stayed at home. I went to school. I didn't really want to study engineering. I didn't know an engineer. In my city of Charleston in those days, they didn't have en engineers that I knew of, locomotive engineers on the railroad. But uh, I, I signed up to be a physics major. I thought I would get into air conditioning, not, not through mechanical engineering, but, but physics, because those were the kind of subjects that I was interested in. Scientific type things interest me. And so uh, I started taking the basic, the, basic, the basic college courses, and I was in my third year before, the, before the, uh, the Citadel realized that I was really switching my major, and I was strictly enrolled as, a, as an engineering student, and I was a, a, a civil engineer, and so I got a degree in civil engineering. Dwayne, what was your life like during the war? I mean, what did you do? Were you in, were you in high school at the time? Yeah, I was still in high school. Okay. So. So what I was, danced my way right through the war. <laughs> well, I mean, did you have rationing back at home? You know, the fellows my mind, age were still home. <laughs> I haven't, you know, I didn't uh, live through this period of time, so you, you have to describe to me what, yeah. what it was like. Well, you, you knew that you were going through a war because everything was rationed, like food and stuff like that. You had red stamps to buy meat and butter and everything, and then you had stamps to buy shoes. Uh, you were only allowed so many pairs of shoes. Really? Uh, Why? I don't know. I think they the well, they issued books and all. Yeah, because everything went to our boys in service. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and you really That's didn't right, mind yeah. doing this because, like, I you know I didn't go into service, but every cousin I had, like male cousin, were they? I was the youngest one on my side of the family, and so you know on both my dad's side and my mother's side so I was the only one of the few children that were left home all the cousins the boy cousins were in service and my uncle Did they and all to you and yeah, yeah we got a lot of email letters and uh, they were they interesting like little letters and they fold up in a real thin paper yeah, and, now, uh, v -mail. and you, you sent probably care know what packages email is. every yeah, what's yeah. Right. V mail was, this came on a special it's form. Like a microfilm, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and, and you had to write on that form, and then yeah. they copied it. It was very thin, and, and they mailed that. Some it's special. like air mail, you mean? Yeah. Well, it was sent air mail. But, but they called it V mail. But v, when you filled it out, it was a little piece of paper about this big, and you wrote you, real small, and you then you have folded extra the sheets sides in, in and you folded the top and the all. bottom, and, almost, and it all folded up into one little tiny envelope. Almost, it was the forerunner of the medical bills today and things. <laughs> Prior to all, the days, things where they do with all the modern equipment, it was a, a V mail letter. You, you, you hated to get the darn things yeah. because you knew it was just almost like a. A form that you could write anything you want on it, but it was a form that you had to follow. You couldn't add extra pages or pictures or anything in there. Yeah. And it was Don't just a very thin paper. Oh, every, all yeah, all your letters, all, the, all the letters had to be censored. I, I got in a big argument with one of the guys on our crew, and I was a, I was a member of a B-17 crew. There was 10 of us. Now, we had uh, five officers and five enlisted men. And the officers, since they were officers and they wore gold bars, they censored their own mail, but since you were an enlisted man, the government didn't trust you, so you had to have your mail censored, which is another thing that bothered the hell out of me. And one of the guys on our crew cut things out of one of my letters, and I never got over that. What did he, you is, do? he cut some things out of my letters. I was writing to a girl I knew, and I don't know what I said or what, but uh, I've forgotten Maybe now. Maybe you knew Dwayne. No, I, I didn't know <laughs> No, Dwayne. I never knew I him. Never, yeah. So, um, uh, but it, those kind of things had happened during war, you know, loose slips, sink ships, yeah, and right. all those things, you know, and, you know, you weren't supposed to talk about where you'd been or where you were going. I was coming through Charleston once. I was on my way overseas. I was in Savannah, and my family was all in Charleston. And my dad worked for the railroad, and we had to change engines, and I sneaked off the train and ran into a store, and this is how long ago, we used to call it the Greeks. In Charleston, you call people by, by you have to their, nationality. their nationality. 
the Jews, the Greeks, the, the whoever's, you know. Uh, we, we, we had a, a Jewish boy, now this, this was so crude and rude, I can't believe we did it. This is before the USA got in the war, and we called him Hitler, because we were aware of problems with the Jews and the Germans over there, and we thought this was funny, but that's, that's the time it was. And my dad used to say, I'm going down, when he, on the way to the railroad, he'd stop at the Greeks, which was right next, just a little corner grocery store. The day you might call it a mom and pop store, but this was even before that. That was ancient, and it was run by a Greek family. He called it the Greeks. As a matter of fact, it was the Lempuses, good friends of Krusty, Dr. Dr. Uh, Louis Lempus is a heart specialist in Charleston right now. That's one of the sons. And, and anyways, I got, I was in Savannah, Georgia, being sent to Camp Kilman in New Jersey, stopped in Charleston, but you're not allowed to tell anybody. I sneaked off the train, ran across the street and into, just hoping that I would see my dad. Well, because he wasn't there. And so I told Mr. Lempus, I said, I'm Rowdy Condon's son, I'm Rowdy Condon's son. He didn't know me or what. I used the telephone and I called home. And they said, where are you? And I said, I can't tell you, except if you remember when Pop stops at the Greeks, that's where I am, you know? And so they couldn't believe it. But then it was time for the train to leave, so I had to go back. And, and for, for an 18-year-old boy, and I guess I was 19 then, boy, the tears, yeah. the tears flowed like crazy. You were in your hometown and you couldn't tell your people, and if I could have gotten word to them in the first few minutes, it was a 10 minute drive. They could have gotten there and we could have hugged or kissed or waved or whatever, but we had to, you know, we went on up the coast, went on up to, to, to Camp Kilmer. But that was just one of the interesting things. Was there anything that, that uh, when you folks grew up, was there anything that's, that was really traumatic that happened, an accident, uh, physical, uh, Give me an idea of uh, if, if there was anything that was that dramatic in your life that sort of changed things, or the way you think, or... Yeah, you were involved in a car accident. I was in a car accident when, when I was four years old, and my grandfather, which would have been a step-grandfather, like, uh, was killed. He was driving the car. We were on the way to Youngstown, Ohio, and my mother and I were put in the hospital in Salem for three months. And uh, what year was this? I almost had my arm amputated. They wrote up a newspaper article that a little four year old girl <coughs> had her arm amputated. What year was this? And of course it wasn't, but that would have been, uh, I was born in 29, 33, about 1933. That was Grace's probably. Father? No, that would have been her stepfather, yeah. And, uh, One second, I'm going to change tapes here. <laughs> 